So, so, so I, I kind of I almost uh, started off as an unknown brush with death, and to a known brush with death, and then more recently, you were, you were saying that you you've come through a, an amazing battle. Yeah, well, that's the thing. The other thing about cancer is, you know, I think it's very important you have a positive mental attitude. I don't think there's much you can do about, you know, beating cancer. I don't think you can do anything like that. I just think you can be cured or not. And, mm. uh, you know, I was very lucky in that uh, I've just had the seventh month all clear. And they say that, you know, Congratulations. that's um, it's quite a good thing. But it certainly makes you reappraise your life and various things that you know you're doing mm. and it's not it's not a good thing especially throat cancer because you can't eat or drink for four months you have to be fed through a tube into your stomach mm. and it's not a nice thing so but anyway i've survived that's the main thing thanks to the brilliant care of the national health actually yeah what was your what's your reappraisal been like what's that how's, how's that changed you well it's made me not waste time you know i've kind of had enough of bullshit, basically, and um, I'm doing more things that I want to do, enjoying things more, change my diet a bit, you know, change my lifestyle a little bit, not mm. a lot, but enough that hopefully it'll make a difference, but you don't, you just don't know with cancer, you know? Mm. Could be anybody in this room. Yeah. It probably will be, sad to say. Yeah, absolutely. Anyway, let's talk about something else. So me dying, me dying, <laughs> and what else is there? You live in, you live in as, a, you went to Ireland as a mod. What, what, where did the mod experience start for you? What, what, what was the catalyst for that starting? Well, I could lie, and because my mother did the Small Faces fan club in the 60s, which is, is quite a well-known yeah, biographical yeah. fact, yeah. and I could lie and say that, oh, I was always a mod ever since I was three, and I'm on the front cover of Ichiku Park and various other things, which would be true, but I wasn't actually a mod until I saw the jam and the Buzzcocks in 1978. And I, didn't even, I wasn't even aware of my mother's history of the Small Faces. Basically, the Small Faces rehearsed in the pub next door at my dad's shop. Right. And when they got to be a band, they just said to my mum, who was probably 22 at the time, do you want, you know, that seems so young, but at the time, the Small mm -hmm. Faces were 16, 17. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So it was quite old. Yeah. Um, yeah, so I only found out about that after I got to see the jam, you know, and I, I got into music through a band called The Saints, who uh, are yeah, an Australian yeah. punk band. Yeah, yeah. Massive influence on my life. And from there, I just got into punk, but I didn't, never really got into the attitude, <laughs> the, the poserish nature of the whole anarchy, mm. Sid Vicious type of identikit punk. Mm. I liked the music, but I didn't like the rest of it. And then the Mod Revival came along, and you know, I was lucky enough to be involved in that at the very, very beginning. And, um, you know, it seemed to fit what I was into. And then from there you get into soul music. That opened so many doors into different kinds of music, mm. for me anyway, um, that I didn't really need anything else. Mm. Yeah. It's an amazing catalyst, wasn't it? You know, that whole, that time, and what was happening musically and politically, you know, yeah. we, we, haven't, we haven't got that, have we? No, in fact, you know, I'm, I keep waiting for mm. the next punk rock to come, the next Acid House to come. And I've arrived at the conclusion that I don't think it's going to. Mm. I think now that we are too divorced from that way of life that we had, that we had, that mm. our generation yeah, had, yeah. in that there is no effort. So if there is no effort required to get the latest or the most expensive or the best mm. or the coolest, you can just click on a button and have it, then there's no incentive to be part of something. Mm. You can just have it. And I think everything's kind of got a bit overloaded. And hopefully there will be a back to basics kind of movement isn't that from Leeds, back to where? See what I did there? <laughs> Beautiful. Beautiful. Um, yeah, but I, I can't see where it's coming from. But then if I could, you know, I never saw where Acid House was coming from, you know, until I was in Ibiza in 1986. And then I saw where it was coming from. <laughs> so I hope there is. But the, the cowalisation of Britain, I think, is too strong. Yeah. That was a, I mean, that, that was a short period, wasn't it, from getting into, getting into mod, or, you know, the back end of punk, 77, 78, to... Acid House, if you are at least the very, very beginnings of it, that's a really short space of time and such a massive change. Well, I think a lot of people forget where Acid House came from, from a, from a London perspective, mm. because what exactly happened was there was a club called The Special Branch, which was run by a bloke called Nicky Holloway. Mm. Now, The Special Branch was kind of electro, a little bit of early hip hop, 
jazz funk and jazz, all mixed up in two rooms. Giles Peterson, Andy Webber. You had loads, all the best DJs, mm. Judge Jules, loads of DJs, but pretty much they were all black music DJs. Mm. And Special Marks used to do holidays, and they did a holiday to Ibiza, and 300 people went. All the DJs, Chris Bangs, Bob Jones, mm. every DJ you could possibly think of in London at that time. And on that trip, somebody heard, somebody went to Coo, I think it was, mm. and heard a house record, and came back the next day at breakfast going, you're not gonna believe this, I've seen the future, and everyone's taking this stuff called E. And, you know, heart, literally, on that week holiday, the London club scene split in half. Half mm. of the people were into soul, wanted to stay into black music, and half of them wanted to get, get on one, basically. Mm. And, you know, I was there at the time, and initially, I think it was so brilliantly powerful, this kind of liberating movement that must have been kind of like 67 Summer of Love type mm. scenario. It must have been, even though we called it it was. But I think it must have been. But within six months, I was kind of bored of the music. You mm. know, I think I didn't particularly take E. I mean, obviously I had a bit and it was great, but you know, it wasn't, so I was more into beer, I think at the time. So, so Acid House, particularly techno, which became kind of the focus of Acid House, Quite boring unless you're on drugs, I think. Mm. So, and I particularly wasn't. So I got a bit bored, and then we just got in, got more into jazz and soul, basically, mm. which is where acid jazz came from. The, the yeah. mental attitude of the acid house explosion, but with our music, mm. just making it a little bit more up to date. Yeah, yeah. And you, when did you start working with Giles? Wow, uh, probably 1985, mm. 86. I used to answer the phones at his Radio London show right. called Mad on Jack, I can't remember, it had so many different names, it changed every so often. And uh, we were just good mates, you know, and then after a while, I was managing the James Taylor Quartet, who were the first of those kind of bands. So by 87, you know, James Taylor was assigned to Polydor and I was managing them, but there were loads more kind of bands like James Taylor Quartet coming through. Mm. So we just said, why don't we set up a little label, and, you know, to do stuff like this. And the only real people that were doing that was Giles and me. There were no other labels. They came yeah, a bit yeah, later, yeah. Mowax, uh, Wall of Sound, and mm. people like that came a bit later. So it was just us doing it for about 250 people, and within six months, it had become massive. And I think that was because people were bored of Acid House, musically. Mm. It became very suburban and very kind of tedious. You know, we've ever gone, Acid? Or it well, was you had those crap. amazing, amazing compilations, totally wide compilations, which were, which were great. Yeah, thanks. <laughs> no, no, <laughs> they were, yeah, they were. Who's got, who's got those? Yeah, they have, yeah, they're brilliant, aren't they? Yeah, I think Totally Wild was just our attempt to try and do something a little bit different. Um, up to that point, compilations hadn't really tried to encapsulate a party. Mm. You kind of had 20 disco greats or, you know, like the best of Tamla Motown or mm. Tighten Up, where it was all either genre specific or label specific, mm. whereas what we wanted to do would, was put on a record at a party that you could play all the way through both sides and people would dance, yeah. but it would be varied. Yeah. So, so we mixed demos that came through the door with um, tracks off bands albums that we were signing to Acid Jazz, like the Brand New Heavies, with oldies, with you know new kind of club records that weren't on Acid Jazz, mm. and just kind of mixed it all up. And I mean, I think we did about 20 of those albums in the end, and they were Did very, you? very successful. Wow. I think the first 10 went silver, which was wow. was quite a result for a compilation, 60,000 yeah, yeah. units, you know. It's amazing. Yeah, but you know, it was me and Giles, I can't take credit for it. Giles is um, pretty good with music, you know, he's a bit of a musical genius, dare I say it. In fact, from 1985 to 1990, he was the best DJ in the world, bar none. That mm. is, there's no doubt about it. Anyone who saw him DJ in those years, would have to agree with me, because it's mm. true. 